Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be back. Um, as Pastor Bob said, my name is David, and my wife, Erin, and I, uh, we lead a church uh, in the Syracuse area. And we have three beautiful little girls. They'll be here at the 11 o'clock service. Um, Lilia is 10, Caroline is 7, and Madeline is 4. And uh, one of the things about having these three girls in my life is it's wanted me to be uh, a better person. It's wanted me also to learn some specific skill sets. And one of the skill sets I've been trying to learn recently is the skill of negotiating. <laughs> negotiating. Um, I realize that in eight years, I'm going to have three teenage girls living in my home, and I'm going to need some negotiating skills and your prayers. Um, already, my negotiation skills are not that great. Uh, my four-year-old, she's the type of kid that when she's being corrected or reprimanded, her initial response is laughter. Like, she just always thinks it's funny. She, I think she thinks she can laugh her way out of any sort of punishment, and to be fair, it's happened at times. And uh, last time I was, uh, uh, she had done something to one of her sisters, and so I pulled her aside and I said, Madeline, that's not okay. And she just starts laughing in my face. I'm like, Madeline, I'm, I'm serious. You can't do that. And so I'm starting to get more stern and my tone is starting to get a little louder and a little more serious. And eventually she stops laughing. And I say to her one more time, you understand, it's not funny, right? And she looks back at me and goes, it's a little bit funny. <laughs> So I immediately started laughing, so I lost that negotiation. Well, I'm actually, I'm not joking. I've been reading a book on negotiating, and it's by a guy named Chris Voss, who was the lead negotiator for the FBI for many years. He was the guy who was responsible to negotiate the safe return of American hostages anytime something happened to them somewhere in the world. And one of the things I'm learning from this book is that uh, the negotiation can often be won or lost right at the start. It's about how do you approach the person that you're negotiating with. Right from the beginning, if you have the wrong tone, you've already set yourself up for failure. If you use the wrong terms or if you ask the wrong questions. And so I've been learning about how to approach people in moments of negotiation. Now let me ask you this. How do we approach God? How do we go to God? And I want us to look at a text together in the book of Colossians. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young church uh, in Colossae. And in the end of his letter, we're going to look at chapter 4, he gives them some very helpful instruction, advice, and insight into how to approach God. Specifically, how do we approach God in prayer? And what he said to them is important and true for us today. So let's look at this together. We're just going to read three verses. Colossians chapter 4, I'm reading to you from the ESV, verses 2, 3, and 4. Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, which is the gospel, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to learn three things together, three ways that we should approach God. And the first one is this, we should approach God continually, continually. Paul said, steadfastly continue in prayer. And that means to continue in something, even if it takes a lot of effort, and even if it's going to be difficult, continue in this. Paul is teaching us that prayer is not something that we do from time to time. It's not something that we just sort of set aside five minutes at the beginning of our day for and five minutes at the end of our day for, or we just pray over our meals. Prayer is not something that is prompted by specific occasions or events, but prayer is a position of the heart continually before God. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul instructs us to pray without ceasing, never Stop praying. Well, some of you are thinking, how is that even possible? I have a full life. I go to school. I have a family. I have a job. How can I pray continually? The truth is, is that Paul is pointing out to us that many of us treat prayer like crisis intervention instead of like continual interaction. You know there's a difference, right, between crisis intervention and continual interaction. My wife and I, Hopefully we have continual interaction. But me and my doctor, or me and my dentist, or the guy who fixes our cable, that's crisis intervention. And imagine, husbands, that you only interact with your wives as frequently as you interact with your doctors or your dentists or the person who comes and works on your car. That's a bad foundation for a healthy relationship. 
But how many of us wait for the crisis moments to pray, but in between, there's no prayer at all, or there's very limited prayer? Now, should we pray when there's crisis? Of course we should. Do we tend to pray more than normal when there's crisis? Of course we do. But does that mean that prayer is only crisis intervention? Of course not. Prayer is meant to be continual interaction. Now, what does that look like? There was a Quaker named Thomas Kelly, and he wrote a book called Testament of Devotion. I think what he writes is helpful for us. He says, there's a way of ordering our mental life on more than one level at once. And you know that's true, right? You can be in a conversation but thinking about something else, right? You can be sitting in class but, but miles away considering something, right? That happens all the time. We get that. So he says, on one level, we can be thinking, discussing, seeing, calculating, meeting all the demands of external affairs, uh, going to work, going to school, doing these things. But deep within, behind the scenes, at a profounder level, we, at the same time, can be in prayer and adoration, song and worship, in a gentle, or with a gentle, I love this phrase, with a gentle receptiveness to divine breathings. Underneath it all, a gentle receptiveness to what God is saying and doing in any moment and at any time. And I think for a lot of us, prayer is something we only do in the big moments, but we forget that prayer is something we should do in the boring moments, when there's nothing exciting happening, when there's no crisis, when there's no big situation. And for some of you, potentially, your prayer life isn't boring enough. You probably thought your prayer life was very boring. But if you're not praying through the in-between moments, but you're only praying in the big moments, you're missing out on what Paul's asking us to do here. Now, at this point, maybe you're still thinking, well, this sounds very difficult to do. How do I do this? And what I would suggest to you this morning is you're actually already doing it. You're already turning to something or someone throughout your day with the things that weigh heaviest on your heart. You're already looking to something and bringing your fears and your concerns and your anxieties. You're already doing something with it. You, maybe you're just not directing those things in prayer to God. You're missing the opportunity to pray continually. Think about complaints for a second. What are complaints? I think complaints are just wrongly directed prayers. They're just half-formed prayers that we're not actually directing to God where we are internalizing them and trying to do something with them. So can I give you... Can I just give you some examples of moments in your day when you might be able to have continual prayer, pray beneath the surface? Is everybody okay with that? Okay, good, five of you, awesome. I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, here we go. How about moments when you succeed? You have an awesome day at work. You hit your sales target. You get a promotion. Uh, something amazing happens. You, here's a prayer that you should pray underneath that, underneath that, not stop and pray it out loud, but underneath that, in your heart, be praying things like this. God, I'm so thankful for this. I, I give you the glory for this success because you gave me the abilities. You gave me the opportunity. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, so I thank you. But also, God, protect my heart from making this success the source of my identity and my value and my worth. God, protect me even from my successes. How about when you fail? We can pray things like, God, help me to learn and grow through this. Give me the humility to own up to this and to get better from this, but also, God, prevent this failure from becoming my identity also, or letting this failure overshadow what you say about me and who you say that I am. What about when we open up the newspaper, for those of you that still knows, know what those are, or you go on your phone, and more likely, and you scroll through your Twitter feed, or you go to uh, your website of preference, and you read about like the shootings a couple weeks ago in Pittsburgh. What do you do then? Well, instead of maybe jumping on social media and popping off a political view, maybe what we do is we become prayerful in those moments and we pray things like this. God, comfort those whose hearts are broken right now. Protect our schools and our houses of worship in Rochester. And, and God, expose the hate, not just in other people's heart, but expo expose the hate in my own heart. I'm not that different from people who hate people. There's things in my own heart that I have to be honest about, right? But also, here's one prayer we can always pray and know it's God's will because Jesus told us to pray this. Father, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Prayerful people in all of those moments. How about when you are feeling anxious? Underneath all of your anxieties, you're walking into a meeting at work that you're really anxious about. Walk in in a prayerful position. God, I trust you. I put my hope in you. I cast this care and name what that care is, name it. God, I cast this nervousness, this anxiety, this concern, I cast it upon you as Peter tells us to do because I know that you, you care for me.
All right? How about when you're frustrated? Anybody ever get frustrated during your day or at work or in your home and you're just not sure what to do with your frustrations? One of the things we can do is use those moments as opportunities to position our hearts to pray, God, give me patience and give me endurance. Help me to suffer well. Help me to see things differently. How about this prayer? God, give me the gift of perspective. Uh, as I mentioned, my wife and I, we serve in Syracuse, and one of our favorite pizza places, if you're ever in Syracuse and you need a good slice of pizza, I'm about to just, I'm about to give you some insight here. Uh, this might be the best thing you get out of this morning. I'm just kidding. Hope, hope not, hope not. But um, one of our favorite places to go in Syracuse is a place called Pavone's. And there's a location on Bridge Street in East Syracuse, DeWitt area. It's called Pavone's. And we go there, and it's about 20 minutes from where we live in the Clay Liverpool area. And so, uh, but I like to call ahead because those of you who have kids, you know that like any time at a restaurant, at a table, without food there is torture. So like, so I, I said, Aaron, uh, we got in the car, I said, Aaron, call ahead, to, uh, get our pizza ready, ask him to make our pizza so that we can go in, we can get it, we can sit down, and we can immediately begin to eat. Plus, we had other things to do. She calls ahead. So I walk up to the counter, and I'm like, hi, my name is David, I called ahead, we have uh, some pizzas. And I realize, I overhear a conversation sort of towards the back of the kitchen where the guy admits, I forgot to hand the ticket in. Forgot to hand it in. So then he hands it in. He comes back and he rings me up and he says, all right, go ahead and have a seat. He never says to me, I forgot, it's gonna be a little while, sorry. He never apologized anything. So now I'm like steamed. I'm like, so we're sitting there, we're waiting. I'm trying to entertain my three little girls while the pizza's waiting. And I'm telling my wife, this is exactly why we called ahead so we don't have to sit through this nonsense. And I'm, I'm complaining and all of a sudden I hear my daughters beginning to pick up on my complaining and now they're complaining. Oh, we can't believe we gotta wait for our pizza. This place is done. And, and in, that, in that moment, yeah, they get that from their mom. In that, in that, in that moment, <laughs> she's, at the, she's coming to the next service. Just don't. In that moment, uh, thankfully, God gave me a little perspective. And I listened to my daughters, and I, and I said to them, girls, hold on. I'm, I'm wrong to complain. Think about it. Think about what we're actually complaining about right now. We're complaining that our delicious pizza that we can afford to buy that somebody's making for us, that it's gonna come a little later than we expected it. That's called perspective, right? And sometimes when you walk into frustrating moments of your day, underneath those moments, prayerful heart of God, give me perspective. You know, this may be a difficult conversation I'm about to have, but thank you that I work in a place where I can have these conversations, right? The gift of perspective. What about when you're shopping? Anybody like to shop? When you're shopping, underneath all of your shopping, you can be praying things like this. God, thank you that I can shop. Thank you that I have the opportunity to do so, but also protect me from being a shallow consumer who is comforted by and defined by the things that I can buy off a shelf, right? Those are sort of things we can be praying for ourselves. When you're tempted, God, help me to see Jesus to be, more better, be better, more beautiful, more satisfying than that thing that is currently tempting my heart. When you first meet somebody or when you go to interact with somebody or have lunch with someone, God, help me to see this person the way that you see them and to love them the way that you love them. How about, how do you pray when you have to sit there and watch the Red Sox win another World Series? This is what I was praying. God, I know someday you're gonna make all things right. Like, God, you're, God, you're gonna make all the sad things come untrue, and so I just trust in your plan. Like, I don't see your hand in this, but well, I don't trust your heart. We pray continually. Secondly, we pray watchfully. Paul said, continue steadfastly in prayer, and he said, be watchful in it. And this idea of being watchful, it's a readiness, it's a readiness with sensitivity and awareness. So pray with a readiness and with sensitivity and awareness. At this time of the year in upstate New York, as we drive, we have to be increasingly watchful, don't we? For two main reasons, you know what they are, the weather and deer, yeah. It's only bow season right now. It's not as bad as it's going to be. As soon as they, those rifles start shooting in those woods, the deer just start running. So you gotta be super watchful. I actually hit a deer in Rochester when I was in college many, many years ago. It's not a fun experience. So as you're, as you're, you're driving, you're, you're very watchful. You're paying attention. You're looking around. And what you see determines the way that you drive. And Paul is saying here, when you pray, don't bury your head and your heart in yourself. Don't stop looking at the world around you, but be watchful and pay attention and let the things that you notice and the things that the Spirit of God reveals to your heart in your prayer, let that guide and shape the way in which you pray. So I wanna give you three things that you should pay attention to when you go to pray, okay? And the first thing is this, pay attention to the distractions. Anybody else in this room get distracted when you pray? 
like you sit down to pray and all of a sudden you think of like 12 different things. You know what I've learned to do over the years? I turn those distractions into prayer. Like you got to do something with them. Otherwise, you're never going to pray. So often distractions are your real prayer needs pushing in on you. And so if you're sitting down to pray and all of a sudden you start thinking about a meeting you have to have later or a difficult conversation or you're, you know, somebody who has a physical illness, and you, instead of just being distracted and being, immediately turn that into prayer. So pay attention to the distractions. They're not always the enemy of prayer. Sometimes they're the feeder of prayer. Pay attention also to the pain around you, to the hurt around you. Even when you walk into a beautiful church like this on a Sunday morning, there's people sitting right around you right now that have deep pain, deep hurt, real questions in their heart. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Say, God, I want to see those people. I want to notice them. I want to be a part of your body, doing the work of ministry, strengthening each other, serving each other, edifying, encouraging, building up each other. But also look for the pain in your neighborhoods. Pay attention to your neighbor's lives. Pay attention to uh, who goes in and out of their homes. And no, no, Actually, now I'm telling you, you sound like a stalker creeper. But, but, but pay attention in a, in a way that informs the way that you pray for them and the way that you know them. Okay? So be, be, be mindful and watchful of the things around you. But also be mindful and watchful and pay attention to what God is doing in circumstances. Prayer is not about us convincing God to get engaged with our activity, Right? Prayer is about us positioning ourselves to see God's activity and then getting engaged with what he's already doing. He's already working. He's always at work. He's not really waiting for you to get to work. He's already at work, but we in prayer position ourselves to see what he's doing so that we can join in. And let me say this about watchfulness and then we'll go to the last point. Praying watchfully isn't necessary if you only pray selfish prayers. People who only pray selfish prayers don't need to be watchful. They already know everything that they want. Now, is there anything wrong with praying for yourself? Of course not. Is there anything wrong with uh, bringing your needs before God? Of course not. But what percentage of your prayer life revolves around you praying prayers for yourself? You gotta pay attention to that. It's interesting in this text is, did you notice where Paul was when he wrote this letter? He's in prison. So Paul's in prison. He's in Rome. We don't know for sure if he's actually in a Roman prison or if he's under house arrest. But either way, this is probably his final imprisonment. He's awaiting execution. And Paul's writing this letter to a church in Colossae that he's actually never physically visited. Uh, He knows about it because a man named Epaphras, who lives in Colossae, came to Ephesus when Paul was there, heard the gospel, went back to Colossae, and started that church. And now Epaphras has traveled all the way from Colossae to Rome to give Paul a report on the church. And so now Paul is writing this letter, and he's going to send it back with Epaphras all the way to this. And this is how we have the book of Colossians. But Paul, when he says, pray for us also, he says, pray for us for an open door. Now, if I heard Paul ask for that, I would have assumed at first, Paul's asking for an open door out of prison, right? I mean, that makes a lot of sense, but that's not what Paul's asking for. He's not asking for anything selfish here. Not that that would be anything wrong to pray for, but he's not. He's saying, pray that God gives us an open door so that we can declare the mystery of Christ right where we are. So what he's saying is, don't pray for my circumstances to be changed, but pray that I would be changed in the midst of my circumstances. That God would give me boldness and confidence and opportunity to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to my captors, to the other people who are imprisoned. In fact, Timothy Keller, in his book on prayer, entitled Prayer, says that in all of Paul's requests for prayers in the New Testament, he never asks for a prayer for a change in his circumstances. Because Christians don't pray first to see change, they pray first to be changed. Because our greatest need is for us to be changed in whatever circumstances we happen to find ourselves in. And if you're not watchful, you won't pray those sort of prayers. All right, lastly this morning. So we pray um, continually, we pray watchfully, and then thirdly, we pray gratefully. He said in the text, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. I just want to give you three things that we should be thankful for every time we pray, and then we'll finish. Number one, we should be thankful that we can approach. We're talking about how do we approach God, but the bigger issue is this. Why are you even allowed to approach God? What gives you the right, what gives me the right to approach 
a holy God. And the truth of the matter is, is that what gets us the right to approach God is not anything that we've done. It's not our performance record. It's not us listing out our resume. Here's all the good things. Here's all the badges pinned to my chest. Now let me into the throne room of God so I can bring my prayer request to a holy God. What allows us to have access to God in prayer is not our work, but it's the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And that's why when you hear Christians often pray, the last thing they say is, in Jesus' name, amen. Or we pray in Jesus' name. That's not trite. That's not just sort of a religious mantra. That means I come before the Father. I come before God the Father because I'm coming. Jesus' name is the name that speaks for me. It's Jesus' performance that gives me access. And so we should always be thankful that we can approach. Secondly, we should be thankful, and I think this is in your notes, that he already knows and he always cares. Let that truth settle into your heart when you think about praying. He already knows. The Bible says God already knows what you need before you even ask. He always cares. Peter said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Now, when I bring my needs to somebody on somebody else, I have to inform them because they don't already know, and I have to convince them to care because people don't always care. But you know, you don't have to go to prayer with those two concerns. You don't have to go trying to inform God, and you don't have to go trying to convince God because he already knows, and he always cares. What a faithful God. What a faithful God. If he already knows, this is what it means. He's already working on your behalf. He's already been at work. The grace that you need for this week preexisted in Jesus Christ before the foundations of the world. He already knows and he always cares. And then lastly, we can be thankful that God is praying through us and he's praying for us. We don't pray alone. In fact, prayer is entering into an ongoing activity of the Godhead, the Trinity. We bring our prayers to God the Father. The Spirit prays through us, but the Son is praying for us. Let me explain real quickly, and then we'll finish. What does it mean that he prays through us? Well, Paul writes in other places that the Holy Spirit prays through us. There's three ways the Holy Spirit prays through us, in my experience. He prays through us with our words. He prays through us sometimes with his words. And he prays through us often when we have no words. No words. Says he, even when all we can do, have you ever been in such a dark moment? Have you ever been in grief so deep that you can't even put your words together? You got no words. When you've seen people really grieving, often all you're hearing is their sobs and their groans and their breathing. And you know what's happening in those moments? The Spirit of God is praying through them. You don't have to be an impressive prayer if the Spirit of God is praying through you. Last year when we lost my dad and my brother in a very difficult 2017, I remember in the midst of that, my six-year-old kept a prayer journal at her school. And there's a picture of her, her prayer journal. And all she did in her prayer journal on one page was write my mom's name over and over and over, grandma, grandma. And I remember seeing that. Her teacher sent that to me. And of course, first I sobbed for about two hours. But then when I, once I was done doing that, I realized, I, I thought to myself, I posted this on Instagram, and I said something like this. If you think that your prayers have to be more eloquent, more verbose, more structured, more impressive than, that, than, than those prayers, you don't understand the heart of God. Sometimes the, the, sometimes the most effective prayer that you can pray because of where you're at is just calling out a, a lost child's name over and over and over, and you're not praying alone because the Spirit is praying through you. You're never alone in prayer. The Holy Spirit's praying through you. But not only is God praying through us, he's also praying for us. What does that mean? After Jesus lived the life you and I should have lived, died the death you and I should have died, was buried, rose from the dead on the third day, he ascended to the right-hand side of the Father, where the Scriptures say he now lives forever to make intercession for you. Do you know what it would do for you for just 30 seconds if you could hear into heaven and hear Jesus, the Son of God, praying for you by name? Do you know what kind of strength that would fill your heart with? What kind of hope that would give you to endure? Well, it's happening. 
It's happening. You may not be able to hear it, but it's happening right now, this morning. Jesus is interceding for you. He's a faithful high priest who knows what you're going through, who has gone through what you've gone through, who has made himself the sacrifice for your sins, and now is preparing a place for you where someday God will indeed make all the sad things of life untrue and bring all things to fruition and make all things whole. Why? Because we have a God who prays for us. Jesus prays for us. And you know what it does when you realize that? It makes you so thankful, so grateful. Prayer is not a chore. It's an act of thanksgiving. It's a joy. When my, one of my daughters, Caroline, when she turned uh, five years old, it was a school day. And uh, as like all little kids, she wanted to open her presents immediately. She didn't want to wait until after school. Who wants to wait to open presents, right? Nobody. And so we're having breakfast together, and we bring all the presents down, and we stack them up on the table, and she takes them one at a time. And what she did stunned us. Before she opened every single gift, she looked at Aaron and I, and she said, whatever it is, thanks. Whatever it is. I know, dad of the year, right? 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 (laughs) Just kidding. Whatever it is, thanks. And when you trust the heart of God, that this is a God who's made a way for you to bring your prayers to him, despite the fact that you and I do not deserve an audience with him. When you trust the heart of God that he already knows and he always cares, that he's praying through you, that he's praying for you, then when you go into prayer, whatever it is, thanks. Whatever comes today, thanks. Whatever comes tomorrow, thanks. You know why? Because it's all grace. It's grace on top of grace on top of grace, And someday we're going to look back and we're going to realize it was even more grace. And it was even more grace than we could have possibly understood or received. But in prayer, our hearts are positioned continually, watchfully, and gratefully to receive his grace. Let's pray. God, this morning we give you thanks. We respond to the truth of your word by looking inside by the work of your spirit and saying, make me one who prays more continually, more watchfully and more gratefully in your grace and by the work of your spirit. We thank you, God, for who you are and what you've done. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.